Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll even distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. All right, welcome back to another episode of It Is What It Is Podcast. I'm your host, Cody Kelly. Look, connect with me on all streaming platforms, and I do mean all. Oh, you can click at this link below. Should be popping up. YouTube page. You want to keep seeing great content. Follow me there. I have an amazing episode on dealing with what the heck is happening. I mean, a lot of stuff is happening globally, politically, and we're going to get into it today. I have some amazing guests, and I appreciate my guests so much. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. We'll start with none other than the right Reverend Derek Scott. Well, thank you kind sir it's such a pleasure to be on with you and um enjoying the 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 political atmosphere and all things that's happening uh just glad to be here with such uh great folks uh on this uh, call looking to dive in i i am a derek scott as he's mentioned i live in michigan father of seven husband of one and uh just uh overall engaged in community uh service community engagement uh and everything in between so um, I don't like talking about my own resume, so I'll leave it at that. I appreciate it. And none other than the amazing, the talented former Chicago native now resides in the great uh, Wakanda, we know as Atlanta, Georgia, Amanda Joy. Amanda, if you can introduce yourself. Sure, sure. I'll keep it kind of short. So also family woman. I have a husband and a daughter. Also, I am a puppy mother, a recent new addition. Um, as far as work goes, I actually do social media. So I have the ins and outs of all things social, but from a different perspective. Um, if you want to find me, I'm actually AJ the anti-social because I have lots to say about that too. Um, but other than that, I actually lead the diversity and inclusion segment for Honda Power Equipment, which is local to Atlanta. Um, and I am a producer for that series. Awesome. She just killed everybody's resume here. <laughs> All right. That's why, that's why we invited. We have just amazing talent, amazing <laughs> talent. And then none other than my good and friend, uh, future presiding Bishop uh, Ladarius Jerome. Bill, Ladarius, if you can introduce yourself. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm L. Jerome Bill. I'm just a community organizer working with different uh, institutions in the Inglewood, Auburn, Gresham neighborhoods, uh, trying to just encourage somebody's hope and, and, and push the community forward. My resume is not awesome. as lofty as the others. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I love it. Look, let's get down to it. So we've had an interesting two weeks, right? We had a presidential debate that was anything but civil. Uh, it was nothing but a screaming match and filled with SNL um, uh, hoopla, let's say that, right? A uh, lot of just interesting outtakes. And then we had a vice presidential debate to follow that was a bit more civil as far as this political makeup, uh, even though to me, both candidates lacked as far as their delivery. But I do think there was some clear insight, at least into some subject matter. So let's get down into it. So we'll start with uh, none other than Derek, and then you, Amanda, then Bill. What was your initial thoughts on the vice presidential debate? Oh, we're just going to jump right to it, you know. Um, so I let, let me say I, I don't believe that there are winners and losers in the in the debate, the night of the debate, and this is why. I believe that there's a lot of conversation that happens in uh, the the aftermath of the debates and a lot of uh, cleaning up. You know, fact checking, uh, figuring out who threw out uh, what points that were sticking with what groups. And and I think both candidates did a really good job of uh, sticking to their party's um, line. I think they, they played it safe. Nobody, uh, at least in this debate, we didn't see anyone uh, throw the haymakers at the other person sitting on the other side of the stage. I think for um, Kamala Harris, um, she approached the issues and approached uh, the failures of Trump without necessarily digging into uh, Pence's record. 
Um, I think Pence on the other side did a good job of uh, playing the rope a dope game and avoiding the major blows and the major punches uh, by uh, sort of uh, sticking, not just sticking with the safe answers, but avoiding the the tough questions. And I think for me, uh, that's the the biggest takeaway from that debate is the, the avoidance of the tough questions, issues such as uh, health care. What, what is the medical plan that's coming uh, and proposed on the, the Trump side of the aisle? Um, economic policy. And, and this is the big one for me and will always be the sticking point for me on the economic side. Uh, what is the economic policy that really will help move our communities forward on, on both sides of the aisle? And um, I don't think that we saw a strong, strong uh, push to do something radical. I think we, we've kind of seen what the Republicans are going to do, and there was nothing offered different or that showed us that they're going to go in a different uh, uh, direction from what the, the, the status quo is. But I also didn't see anything strong for, on the other side of the aisle that came out and said we're really going to tackle uh, a, a lot of these major economic issues and, and it's just kind of get right to it. Um, I think one of those issues for me is um, the idea of, and without even getting into reparations, but the idea of how do we move uh, black and brown minority communities forward economically by making sure that we're getting access to capital, we're, we're intentionally driving uh, policy and monetary policy that pushes money uh, out of the door, not just to the wealthiest Americans, but gets it into the hands of folks who can put those dollars to work to start businesses, um, to uh, how do we get rid of student loan debt, and we're not just talking about the ten thousand dollars. We're talking about how do we eliminate student loan debt? Um, and I haven't seen a there's been a back and forth and wasn't really clearly addressed, uh, even from uh, the Biden side, exactly how they intend to do it or, or what those numbers are or what the cutoff for for income is, whether it's one hundred twenty five thousand or it's two hundred fifty K or whatever the case may be. So I think both of them did a good job of sort of tackling um, the safe issues without going too far. Awesome. Love it. Amanda, other than the mosquito fly landing on Pence's head, right? What really to me, stood, <laughs> right? Or to you, right? What really stood out uh, in this vice presidential debate? Sure. In all transparency, I was still exhausted from the presidential debate. Um, and I'll say I'm relatively new to politics. So this is the first go round where I feel like I have consumed myself with the facts and not just the opinions and gotten into the trenches instead of just staying high level with mm -hmm. red versus blue. And so my first full presidential debate happened to be Pence and Trump. And that was as we all know, the shit show that it was. Um, but what we learned from that is that there is a complete avoidance of the facts. So we're not talking about anything that's relevant. We're not talking about platforms. We're throwing mud and dirt on each other. Um, what we saw, and I did see clips of, of clips of the vice presidential debate, we saw a little bit more fact, but what we saw was Ms. Kamala coming to clean up a little bit of the mess. Um, I think that was Pence's agenda also, but still we, we didn't get much of what is the agenda, what is the plan from either. Um, they kind of tiptoed around it. But I think overall, the biggest goal was to make it known that even if the presidents may not be the presidents of choice for most on both sides, um, backup on both sides that would be capable of at least talking through the facts with you. Um, still, I can't say from either side that we got all of the details in the trenches. We didn't learn too much about what are we doing for um, minority economies. We didn't learn anything about what are we doing for student loan debt. I still have not heard anything strong when it comes to either of those two, which are imperative for things that we're tackling now. Um, but at least we know that people can talk and they can speak soundly. What I did learn was watching SNL, which usually <laughs> takes on the topic in all honesty um, but they could take it on with a little bit of humor, which helps us to take the blow a little bit better. Still with SNL, what we saw was Kamala comes in and she cleans up the mess. What we saw was um, Pence comes in and he very vaguely discusses what's actually happening. But we can see that that is the agenda of the Republican Party in 2020. Um, I watched Meet the Press on yesterday and they spoke to someone who happened to be at the White House during the Corona Party. And she completely dodged every single question. But what she kept telling the reporter was what I came to talk about is X, Y, and Z. So their intention is to um, tell you what the agenda should be, tell you what their strengths are along that agenda. And I think that's what we've seen in both presidential debates. Now, what you take from those agendas is not what we've come to expect, um, but we got what they intended to show. 
Totally agree. Totally agree with you, man. I totally agree with you, Derek. I think there was a lot of dodging of questions on both sides. I think Kamala's standpoint was how to make Joe uh, look attractive to the to voters on both sides, to conservatives and to Democrats without isolating anybody and then trying to call harm or call foul uh, on the Trump administration. I think her point, or at least her stance, was uh, to really stick it to them on the COVID issue. That was the biggest thing. And then the rebuttal was, well, what about the economy? And I don't think either or suffice. Ladarius, I'm going to hit you with this. So what was your thoughts, right? Um, There was a lot of communication. I will say, though, it was definitely civil. I'll give him that. If there was anything that wasn't name calling, it wasn't a lot of talking over, even though Pence disrupted and Kamala had to check him a few times with, excuse me, I'm talking, but nothing out of the norm, right? Nothing like the presidential debate. What was your thoughts on the VP debate? Yeah, this is the problem with answering last that you pretty much echo everything <laughs> you've already heard. Yeah. But I, I, I noticed that there was a lot of evasive responses, uh, but I think, you know, there's... The, 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 there's fluid that goes into why they were so uh, evasive. I think Kamala knew she had to avoid that angry black woman stigma. You know, if she goes on there and rip him up, like we know she can, because she did it with the Supreme Court uh, guy. Uh, yep. Kavanaugh. Yeah, yeah. So, so we know she can go there. Um, but I think she wanted to largely avoid that coming off the very disastrous presidential debate, you know, I think they both was trying to play it safe in that regard. And so, and then there's some things that uh, Joe Biden has not been absolutely clear on. And so she can't come articulate a message with clarity that, you know, if she she doesn't have it uh, or seem to try to upstage him, you know, he won't respond to, will you stack the Supreme Court? So, you know, the number two can't come on here and give a definitive answer on this when the party's nominee has avoided answering. So I think she had to play the play it safe with that regard. Um, and then on Pence's side, I saw Pence doing uh, what is typical for uh, privileged, for the privileged group, very dominant, over talking both her and the moderator, something yeah. I'm not sure he would have done if the moderator had been a male uh, and if he was debating a male. Um, so mm. I, I saw the evasion and then I also saw the lack of substance. And that's something we've been missing pretty much the entire campaign. Uh, a lot of repetitiveness, a lot of repetition, rather, about Trump is the worst president in America. OK, I don't think anyone is. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, anybody listening is going to really have a disagreement with that. So then what are your strategies? What are your proposals? What have you, what, what kind of comprehensive legislation uh, are you going to enact? And that's what we're not getting uh, from, I don't think we're getting from the Biden campaign. Uh, Pence reiterates Trump's message of law and order. You know, mm-hmm. there is no systematic racism. Racism is a myth. You know, we got civil rights laws, so all of that is over with. It's a thing of the past. You know, those very conservative principles that we're used to seeing from the Repu- hearing from the Republican Party. So while I think each side was anchored in their uh, political ideology, I also see that there is a lack. There was a major lack of substance and seriously uh, evasive on both sides. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's take it up a notch. Look. Most of this show, when I emailed you guys, we were talking about double consciousness, right? I think most people uh, deal with a multi-layered existence, a universe, right? Uh, No matter how you identify whatever political category you place yourself in, it's not that you always agree, right? I think like you just can't always agree, right? Like, uh, you know, Bill, Derek, we come from a similar uh, faith-based background. So we have this kind of uh, lane, but that doesn't mean I stay in the lane, you know? So we know that RBG has unfortunately passed away and that her seat is up. And Amy Comey Barrett is now the nominee to replace her. And they have the house and the Senate. They only need, uh, 51. There's 53 Republican senators Two could basically not vote. They could get it without any democratic support. Right. So, but for me, you know, I believe personally in a woman's right to choose. And I believe that right is going to be taken away with uh, the nomination of uh, Justice Amy. Now, I, I, I don't have any doubt of Justice um, 
Amy's competence or qualifications. I just don't think it's the needed balance for the Supreme Court. It says, Bill, I started with you last. I'm going to start with you first, then Amanda, then you, Derek. So what are your thoughts, right? Uh, Amy Comey Barrett. Now, I get it. She's appealing, especially for the religious right. I totally understand that. And some of her stances, I've, you know, I've kind of scratched my head and said, mm. but at the same time, I think you can have too much of anything is a bad thing. What are your thoughts? Now, uh, you and I are going in a different direction on this one. Because <laughs> I am pro-life. But I'm a different kind of pro-life than most who tout pro-life. When I say pro-life, I actually mean life. That is quality health care, quality schools, quality neighborhoods, quality, quality resources, opportunities. This is what helps to, to build and shape actual life. Okay. So because the Republicans, you know, conservative, I should say, uh, right. will will run you down about you know, sanctity of life, protect the innocent and the unborn. And then when they get here, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, you're on your own now. You know, I don't think that's pro-life. Pro-life extends itself for me, even sure. into other areas of, you know, the death penalty and even mass incarceration, which is nothing but post-modern day slavery, you know? So, uh, so when I say pro-life, I am all inclusive about being pro-life. Amy Barrett, she's a she's a rock star with the conservatives. There is no question about she's she's going to be confirmed to the Supreme Court. They have the votes. They have the numbers. Uh, conservatives are pleased with how her opening statements went today. They're going to do it. And that's the thing about conservatives. Conservatives play to win. Democrats try to play fair. Republicans are just trying to win. They are concerned about money and power, and they'll do anything to get it. Don't do anything to hold on to it. And so even now, right now, every poll has Trump down significantly, way yeah. worse than it was four years ago. I'm not sure that anyone is so confident that he's going to win. But that seat on the Supreme Court, that's a golden seat. And they're going to ramshack that thing to make sure she's confirmed. So there's no question about whether or not she's getting to the court. There should, there should be, there is and there should be legitimate concern about her getting to the court. Is she going to get to the court and reverse universal health care? That should be alarming, especially amid a worldwide pandemic, especially amid crisis in health where doctors are not informing patients of conditions they have because doctors know they don't have the insurance or the money to, to cover these things. So these things should be concerns of ours. Uh, but as far as Amy Barrett, she's going to be the ninth seat on that court. <laughs> awesome. Amanda, what are your thoughts on uh, Justice Amy? You're muted. You're muted. My thoughts. So I have lots of thoughts and I'm trying to pinpoint what is most relevant to this question. So when it comes to this question, I do. I believe that she's going to get the seat. I mean, I think the seat is hers. Um, I think Mr. Beal brought up a great point. What is conservative? Um, conservative is usually caring about power and caring about money. Um, we, I think it's so overstated that, yes, um, people should have the right to choose. You're taking away the right, but we're putting a woman on the panel who's then she's kind of diluting that system because our argument has always been men should not be able to say what a woman can do with her body. And here we go with a woman saying what a woman should do yeah. with her body. I read an article in the New York Times just yesterday. I um, mean, it was a story. Um, this lady, she says, I was conservative, born and raised in the church, brought up with all the conservative values. I did the rallies that were all pro-life. Um, my life was going well in 2019. My husband got the job that he'd always wanted. He's now a VP of whatever this company is. Um, we have two biological children and four that are adopted. We took them all on a vacation. Um, and it was the moment that my husband's neck crashed in a wave on the beach that life changed. And this is like tearful. She says, we all watched his neck break when he was hit by a wave on the beach. She said, that's when my life changed. That's when what I believe in changed. She said, I'm high risk. That's why I was not able to carry as many children as I would have liked on my own. And they were adopted. The doctor has already told me that if I have any more children, that's my life. So she went through with burying her husband and found out that she was pregnant. So then she 
as do I risk my life for another child or do I save my life for the six children that I have? She mm -hmm. said, go against everything that I have known to be true and finally say that I'm pro-choice. In this case, there are speculations or there are details that somebody can't say are ultimately one size fits all. Right. Um, so it's those things that I don't think are being considered. But when you put a woman in that place, then that eliminates some of the argument that we have with men shouldn't be able to make that choice. And so that's strategic. That's very much a power play. That's very much a strategic move so that we can abolish one of your arguments. This woman says that it's OK. So it should be OK for all. But that is what we see with conservatives. This is OK for us. Christianity is perfect for us. Um, this tax bracket, the way that this goes, is perfect for us. Healthcare, perfect for us. So it should be perfect for you. And if not, so be it. So that's what I see is happening. There's a shift. Um, there's also a show, um, Lovecraft Country. And it's so funny that they're talking about the 50s and Jim Crow era, but they mentioned so many things. It's so important to know that um, what they have been doing to us has not changed. But now they're trying to flip the script. And so we just have to be very aware of it, very cognizant. We have to already have our rebuttals, knowing that half of the argument that a man, man should not choose what we do with our body is about to be abolished. So um, it's happening but we just have to be prepared for what do we say? How do we still defend this, even though half of the argument is going away in a couple of couple of weeks? Hmm. Well said. And and to echo uh, Amanda's point, uh, Derek, and then Malik, thank you for joining. I tell you, my uh, guest Malik is going to join. I appreciate you, brother. I know uh, my man is big time, so you know <laughs> I'm trying to get to that level so he can come on here. Uh, but um, is it Derek? Is it the what I call the Tim Scott effect? Right? Is it like if you can get somebody from an opposing demographic to echo the same sentiment that you're trying to push, all of a sudden it validates itself. Do you see that going on here uh, with the nomination of uh, Justice Amy? You know, I, th I think no doubt it's strategic, right? But you, you still have to find somebody who is, is sort of above reproach, right? And Amy Coney, Amy Coney Barrett's record is is that right. So I think, you know, we heard a lot of conversation around Joe Biden when Joe Biden said, I am going to select a female vice presidential candidate. And a lot of people took exception to that because they said, I would have preferred you have come out and said, I'm going to pick the best vice presidential candidate and then announce. Oh, and by the way, it's Kamala Harris. Um, that's what Trump did here. He said, I'm going to go out and pick who I think is the best candidate for the Supreme Court justice nomination. And I think it's Amy Coney Barrett. Look at her record at Notre Dame. Look at the people who, uh, you know, love her, her professors. You know, they say really, really great things about her. Uh, you know, needless to say, she doesn't have that long of a federal voting record on the U.S. bench. But ne nevertheless, she has a, a, a record that supports uh, her conservative position. And so I think from that perspective, it's not only strategic, but he used the the, the piece that he, you know, uh, it, this pawn in the game to make sure that what, what Amanda so eloquently pointed out, you're not going to be able to punch holes in uh, these decisions because now you're going to have the, the conservative saying uh, she's, she's, look, she's a woman. And uh, some of these issues that she's, she's standing for, she's a woman. But let me back up for a second, because I, I want to address like um, this, this issue of of, of, of pro-life and right. this issue of all of these things that we think are coming down um, the pipe as a result of her being confirmed to the bench. And as a conservative uh, Christian, um, I do not think that we can legislate morality. So let me say that I morality agree. cannot be legislated. And I so agree. for that reason, if God gives people the choice, he says, choose between life and death. He, he, he gives you two roads and he gives you the option and the free will to do that. Right. I think we have to respect people's ability to choose, but then give them uh, the education that they need to make the right decisions, but also give them the resources that they need uh, to opt into uh, making the, the quote unquote right choice. And I think um, Affordable Care Act is 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 one measure that obviously we want to make sure that everybody has access to universal health care or 
uh, we're calling it universal health care, but you know, health care for all, right. so to speak. Um, but I think even beyond that, there's this issue of people having access to resources in general people having access to mental health resources, people having access, if if I do become pregnant with a child uh, and uh, I was raped, right? I don't want my right taken away from me to be able to make a decision because something traumatic happened to me and I'm not able to care for this child. So are there alternatives that supports that person before they see the only option as aborting a baby or aborting life, which again, I'm all for the sanctity of life, but also think people have real life issues and choices that they have to um, balance when they're making some of these decisions. And you can't legislate that level of morality. You have to provide people with the ability to not only choose, but the the resources to make the right decision and what's in their best interest. I love it. I love it. Malik, my man, my <laughs> homie, man, I'm coming to you. Um, you know, I know, you know, um, if just a little, I'm let Malik introduce himself, but Malik is, is a, is a star and, uh, you see him all the time on Roland Martin and a few other shows. And, you know, I just thank God he gave us, you know, time to be on here today. I want to pose this question to you and you can start off by just introduce yourself, but I text you earlier, right? Uh, about a, a couple weeks ago, I was like, you know, can they get, uh, Amy seat field. And he was like, they have enough votes. They don't even need the democratic uh, support. So what are your thoughts on Amy Comey Baird? And then I'll shift to my second question after you answer that. Okay. Well, yes. Uh, sorry for coming in late. I had another interview. As Cody said, my name is Malik Abdul. I'm a GOP strategist here in DC. If you need a hype man, Cody is the one. I'll just start out by saying that. But uh, to your question about Amy Coney, Coney Barrett, I think that she's a great choice. Uh, actually, one of the things that I like about her is that she wasn't chosen from that usual Hale, Yale, um, Harvard uh, pick that we normally get when we're talking about uh, Supreme Court justices. Ironically, one of the things that I, you know, her, Amy Coney, you know, Justice Barrett, well, Judge Barrett aside, one of the things that I think that we need to have a larger conversation about is what happened to black women on the Supreme Court of the United States? This is, I wrote an article last week in the Washington Examiner. You guys are um, welcome to actually Google that. Well, but where I talked about the, the lack of black women on the Supreme Court, I would have absolutely loved Donald Trump to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. I also would have liked Barack Obama to do that in the three tries that he had. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. But what we need to understand is that the Court of Appeals really is the second tier under the Supreme Court of the United States. With the exception of Elena Kagan, all of the justices have come from the Court of Appeals. How many Black women are on the Court of Appeals? Five. So that is five Black women in the entire, out of 179 slots, Black women comprise 5% of that. I mean, sorry, um, they were five of them, which is equals about 2.7% of the number. I think that Amy Co I think that Justice Barrett will definitely get through. Obviously, the Republicans are hypocrites in 2016 um, 2020, Democrats are hypocrites in 2020. That politicians are hypocrites should not surprise anyone, but I have no doubt that if Hillary Clinton had won the election and it was the exact same timing as it was with Justice Ginsburg's death, I have no doubt that Democrats would absolutely move to not just um, appoint, but confirm a Supreme Court justice. But that people are, uh, the, you know, hypocrites, of course they are. I like it. I like it. On to my question, which I'm trying to get here. So we're talking about double consciousness. And Derek, we were on a show. This question was asked, and I've really had to ponder this, right? And it's really just uh, understanding that we might have one specific major group of identity, right? As a, as a black person, black American, African American, however you identify, but that doesn't mean that necessarily it means this specific thing, or we always vote this specific way, right? Or we always like these specific movies, even though I'm sure that everybody is here has probably seen Friday, next Friday, Friday after next, you know, but that that's just kind of a, a guess, right? As a guesstimate. When it comes to that, when it comes to, um, being a an American, being a black person in America, how does how has that affected you? And I, I'll just speak for myself. So, like, yes, and and I started with that. I've saw I've seen the comments from Michael Sager. I guess he's a friend of yours, Eric. Um, you know, I'm uh, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer, preacher as well. But yet, you know, I can't also 
deny these uh, unmitigated circumstances. I can't also deny that women have a different outlook and go through different experiences. And I don't think a man should tell a woman what to do. I'm just my personal thing, right? And that's just because the way my mom kind of raised me, right? <laughs> so, and that is a lot of that is stemming from her. When I when I hear it in my head, I hear her voice. is 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 weird, you know. And even though I might have a personal uh, foundational belief, it's not like it's unbending. You know what I'm saying? And I think for a lot of us, we always will do what's best in the best situation. So I want to talk about that double consciousness for a second. And Malik, I'll start with you. You talked about it. You said it openly on um, on the Roland Martin show. You said in 08, you were a Democrat, you know, and was kind of disappointed like a lot of us. I think we kind of saw the election of President Obama as, you know, the one, right? Like, this is the one we've been hoping, praying for. And not that whatever. I mean, you know, obviously no president is perfect. But let's just say we didn't get what we thought we should have got. Um and from that, I think a, a really understanding of of political identity, of independence that we really can't be placated toward a specific party kind of developed. Right. What has that meant for you, Malik? Well, yeah, you're right. I not only supported uh, Barack Obama in 2008, I actually campaigned for him. I volunteered with his campaign. I voted for him again in 2012. Uh, 2016 was the first time I'd ever voted for a Republican at all. And that person was Donald Trump. But there were a lot of things that I realized from two, between 2008 and 2016, even starting back during the campaign, there were a lot of questions that we did not ask of Barack Obama. And ironically, the person who did ask those questions was Tavis Smiley, not to confuse Tavis Smiley with um, the, the Cornell West. There, the, if you move, if you just transport Tavis Smiley into 2020, and if he was just as demanding of questions on, um, you know, Donald Trump as he was against Barack Obama, he would be back invited to the cookout. But we lost a lot of political capital during that eight, you know, that eight year span where we didn't challenge the president of the United States. Me personally, there's a lot of pushback I get all the time. But this idea of double consciousness, to me, it means that sometimes that you actually may have to take positions that people disagree with. But it's, it's for the better good. And I'll give you one quick example of that. I was having a conversation with an old college friend who was talking about what you know, this is in the South, the deep south and he talked about how his father raised money big staunch like big time democrat proud democrat proud black man down there in alabama and what he talked about is how his father in order to raise money for the school and we're talking millions he had to affiliate he had to associate himself and do business do business with white people that he knew were racist, that white people that he knew were Republicans. But you know what those millions of dollars did? It provided scholarships opportunity for people just like me and many others. So sometimes we have to, you know, we have to, you know, associate ourselves with people that we may not like personally. But if the goal is to better us as a community, then sometimes we have to take that steps. And I think this full-throated 90% of Black people voting one way, which makes us the largest ideological partisan voting group in U United States history, that has not served us well. So if we're having a discussion about double consciousness, we have to talk about that power dynamic and the positions in which we find ourselves where we may have to um, befriend people we don't otherwise like or even would even go to dinner with. No, that makes sense. Like, I live in Chicago, so I know voting 90% one way doesn't work <laughs> um, right here in Bronzeville. Um, Reverend Bill, so I want to go there with you, right? So, you know, uh, this time of year, we'd be gearing up for the Holy Convocation in, well, now St. Louis, you know, whatever. I'm not going to get into that. But, in, you know, the Holy Convocation. And uh, it would be technically voting season. So both things, you know, have eradicated themselves from us. And we would be in the General Assembly trying to select our next pope. I mean, our next presiding bishop. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing. So <laughs> um, double consciousness is what we are, you know, especially if you go to General Assembly. What has that experience been like for you? Yeah, so it's been a fascinating experience to uh, the thing about our church uh, elections, we accept uh, the the response, the results of the election as God talking through his people. 
I mean, theoretically, the saints should be praying. And by the time we get to general assembly, we should be able to discern what the will of the Lord is. Now, I'll let you pick that apart how you want. But, <laughs> but as for me, it's just it's a very moving experience to see. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated with black. And the Church of God in Christ is is the largest black movement, uh, religious movement uh, in the world. If, if my statistics are uh, are accurate and updated, uh, you know, and so to see how we come together and ensure the continuity of our our government, fascinating, moving. Um, I mean, yeah, you have those spots where it's really exciting. I mean, it's really engaging. The speeches are charged with enthusiasm. The, 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 the candidates are getting up, electrifying the house. I mean, it's just wonderful. And then you have those points where it's kind of like, okay, it's time to go home. It's time to leave, especially during that period when we are voting and locked in and can't get out until the, the results are, uh, well, until they're finished counting the, the results. Uh, one way or the other, it's just all a very, you know, as I said, I think I used the right word, fascinating experience. Um, a lot going on there, and we just look forward to God speaking through us as we, you know, select the leadership for the next four years of our church. And so it's very disappointing, and um, I think we're all probably in a little bit of mourning uh, because we're not going to get to experience that this year at least. Awesome, awesome. Amanda, what has that double consciousness been like for you? Um, you know, I I always say I think it's ignorant to speak on behalf of somebody, right? As if everything is always the same. And I never, like like my wife, right? I will never say this is what April likes. You know, like April, my wife April likes what she likes, but she has her own voice. Um, something that I've always tried to do is respect individuality, no matter how it comes across. What is that though? But for us, and especially being uh, black in America, there's there's levels of it, right? We have to kind of coexist in certain worlds. You mentioned before you're head of the DNI. Uh, I think you said uh, Honda. Did I get it correct? Right, you're right. So I, I pay attention, right? <laughs> so you know, so what what has that like been for you? So I think my experience when it comes to kind of how do we break this down is. Um, is a colorism scale. And so that's how I, I feel it or is most impacted or I'm most impacted by it and have been for a long time. So we go back a couple of decades. We're talking high school and I, I got the pep talks. People will treat you different based off of how you look and fair skinned girls versus dark skinned girls and how the dark skinned girls treated the fair skinned girls and vice versa. So that's where I kind of clashed. Um, but then growing even more so, um, I went to a school, inner city Chicago, that was predominantly people of color. Um, I transferred then to a high school that was completely the opposite. It was predominantly people of absolute <laughs> no color, but there were some. Yeah, Sandberg. So I got the experience of both sides um, while also battling colorism, which is is odd um, how I was perceived at a predominantly black school um, as a fair skinned woman of color or girl of color at the time um, versus how I was perceived at Sandberg being a fair skinned girl of color. Um, I remember there were people that straight up told me, you're pretty hot for a black chick. And it's to say, maybe I'm not hot enough to just be hot at the time. Um, there was that struggle, but then there was not black enough for the blacks and not white enough for the whites. So where exactly do I fit in? Where do I fit in in society? Not quite black enough because you talk this way or you carry yourself that way. Not quite white enough because you talk this way or carry yourself that way. Um, and at the same time, when you break it down into um, more of a, a smaller funnel, it's still, even though we do accept that you are black, you're not black enough because you're this color. And we know that people will treat you different based off of your color. Um, say so it was just four different facets of what is black to me? How do I identify? Where do I fit in? Do I fit in anywhere? Or is there a place for me for the girls that just don't? And so there were kind of a lot of different things that that we dealt with or that I, I struggled with and had to come to terms with. But at this point, um, I am who I am and I, I can accept that for, for me. So I am my hip hop loving, Frank Sinatra singing, ice skating, volleyball playing girl. And that's OK. It doesn't have to fit into a certain color. Um, I have to say I identify specifically with this or that. Um, I know the experiences that I've had and either you accept those or you don't. And so that has been my, my, my experience. 
Awesome. Look, I share that because I went to that same high school, Sandberg, so I know exactly what you're imagine, talking about. But imagine coming from Morgan Park. And so, yeah, born and raised in the hundreds, and then you go to Sandberg in Orland Park. And so, yeah. matter of where do I fit? Do I fit? Because at Sandberg, I wasn't quite black enough mm-hmm. um, at Morgan Park. But then when I go to Sandberg, I'm the token because I am black enough, but I'm not quite white enough to fit in with their everyday. Um, so that was the biggest struggle. And I know that that is decades past, but it still resonates now. Um, it absolutely still resonates when you go and you try to meet new friends at work. When you get a new job, it resonates when you find friends at work and you realize that they came from this type of group of black people. And that maybe I came from a different group of cookout type people. So it still very much resonates. But I had that experience decades past to help me kind of come to terms with do I fit? And even if I don't, that's OK. I like it. I like it. Derek, double consciousness. I've, I've heard you really elaborate on this and I really want to pick your brain on it. You are uh, a developer. Uh, you are a rising business mogul and you are you're not a Trumper, but let's say that you lean right. <laughs> you know, I've had conversations with you. Let's say that, let's say if Ronald Reagan was running instead of Trump, you'd probably vote for Ronald Reagan, you know, so that, and, I, and that's, I think that's fair to say. What has that experience of this double consciousness been for you? <laughs> that's funny. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Amanda hit it right on the head and I, I use the phrase, you know, you're too black for the boardroom, but not black enough for the barbershop. And it's, you know, this this challenge of, of having to walk this fine line of saying there are certain views that I have uh, because of uh, my my social uh, beliefs on social policy um, my upbringing and being brought up in a Pentecostal black church and the church of God in Christ um, and a predominantly black church where in Chicago, you saw the democratic candidates mm-hmm. that came through your church on a Sunday. Right. Um, and then, you know, really speaking to Malik's um, uh, comments after seeing them come through Sunday after Sunday, right, or right. I should say every four years, election year after election year, election year after election year, it makes you raise the question at some point to that leadership that continues to bring them in to say, what are we doing to hold them accountable in year one through four uh, before we, we allow them to show back up and, and lobby our vote again? Because I saw them four years ago, but I didn't see them last year. I didn't see them the last months when we were out in the streets putting in the work. I didn't see them putting in the work. And a lot of times when you follow their voting record, their voting record does not always align with the best interests of the, the community that you grow up with. And when you grow up and you finally uh, get old enough to start asking the right questions, you say, well, this, this isn't working for us. This is like something's wrong. And how do we fix it? And so you're, you're kind of caught in between these two worlds where I say, you know, we're forced to choose the lesser quote unquote of two evils, but, um, there's this struggle with people trying to to tell you what is your level of morality or or where your level of morality should be what what your evil should be oh that's so evil how could you support that because that's so evil well you know it, it's hard for me to allow you to decide and pick and choose what i feel is egregiously wrong and something that's tolerable right and so for me my egregious could be very very different than uh, what your egregious is. And I'll just use this example. Somebody um, I was just having a conversation with recently was like, but Derek, you know, um, you're, you're, you're a preacher. And how could you right? the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. And this man, that's clear. Jesus said that in his message on the mountain. Isn't that clear, Derek? I said, yeah, but how somebody interprets it for them could be totally different. Trump's shout out to the proud boys to stand by, right? To stand back and stand by. Those are his peacemakers or whoever he thinks his peacemakers are. Mm. Those could very well be the peacemakers executing the righteousness of God. And in their eyes, they're right. And so I can't leave my sense of morality or my level of what's right and wrong to be left up to what the person next to me believes or even what um, what I've been forced 
to buy into simply because of the color of my skin or simply because uh, well, you grew up in the hood. Why don't you uh, ascribe to these certain practices of policy? Well, because they didn't work for us in the hood and they didn't work for me when I got out of the hood. Right. And so I think um, my challenge a lot of times is and, and my struggle is having to put on my um use the politically correct word on your on your show here you but I, I have to put on my my good old boy hat you know right. and um you know the one that forces me when i go home to the cookout to be called white boy because right. i can't always say what i want to say because i'm being re, you know I'm, I'm my my social media page is always being being followed and tracked uh, what i say is going to affect me in the boardroom when i'm trying to make decisions or move millions of dollars on behalf of my community and so there's this uh, having to find the right space to say what you really, really want to say. And then taking a step back and say, you know what, I'm going to do the Kamala Harris right here. I'm, I'm going to play it real smooth. I'm, I'm going to hold off on what I really want to say right now, because I understand that there's a bigger goal in mind. And that doesn't make me a sellout. That doesn't make me an Uncle Tom. It right. means I'm being strategic with my voice so that when I use my voice, it can be very, very, very impactful. For the people it needs to be impactful for. Awesome. Hey, I, hey Cody, can, can yeah. I just add something very yeah. quickly? Derek actually made a very good point. And that is, you, I talked to so many, you know, other black conservatives and even those of us who are Trump supporters. And they talk about, the, now this is really double consciousness, the world in which we live, because there are many things that even me, I'm critical of the president, I'm critical of the party, but I also know that at some point, if I go too far criticizing the president of the party, then I may not have a seat at the table. So what sacrifice am I willing to make here? I can go after if it's thing around race, gender, class. Yes, I can criticize the president on that. But I'm but the the other side wants me to be um, the pr project Lincoln in my criticism. And so I don't think that every single thing that a president does. One of the things that I realize and move me that's something that moves me over to the Republican side is the the acknowledgement, the realization that most of the things that would affect me personally, me and my community personally happens at the local level. The federal government is not responsible for the fact that black people in D.C. are six times more likely to die from COVID than our white counterparts. That has nothing to do with the federal government. Our schools are horrible. I live in the most under-resourced, underrepresented community uh, neighborhood in the entire city of about 700 or 800,000 people, where our on-time graduation rate at our two high schools is about 50%. That's not a federal government problem. If you want things like your ban on chokeholds, if you want your minimum wage, if you want, you know, a lot of these things happen at the, fe at the local level. And so knowing how to actually balance the criticisms uh, that you that we may have for our party that that doesn't make us a sellout. It doesn't make us a coon. It doesn't make us an mm -hmm. Uncle Tom. Because I can assure you with absolute certainty that you will not find people who was who were critical of uh, the Barack Barack Obama's administration or the Democratic Party who still has a voice in the party. If anybody thinks that, then I have a Hillary Clinton. Um, as President Penn to sell you, because it just didn't happen at all. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, to that a point, uh, two points I'll make before I ask my last question, I've, or this is my first point, I've actually made more money under Republican presidents than I have under Democratic presidents. And that's, I, I know that you shouldn't say that, but it's like, but it's true. my paycheck is looking better under the Trump administration than the Obama administration. It's no sleight of hand. I mean, I still like Obama, I would still vote. But my 401k just likes Trump a little bit more, and that's fine, you know. So you know that's that's just that's just part of it. I, when I log into Robin Hood, I'll be like, you know, thank you Jesus, thank you Trump, you know. So I mean, like that's that's what kind of happens, right? Uh, but to that point, so it, you know, I was an intern in the Illinois Department of Transportation. I was actually put in um, kind of like the small grassroots organizations trying to get uh, Governor Pat Quinn. Uh, reelected. So you're talking about some years ago, right? Uh, I remember clear as day, we were in a campaign strategy meeting and, you know, his staffers was like, we got the election on lock. Bruce Rahner was a Republican, just came out of nowhere. And um, he associated himself with Cory Booker in Chicago and was giving all these monies to the Chicago pastors. Meeks ended up endorsing them. And I tell the guys, I'm like, look, you're going to end up losing Chicago. You haven't campaigned there. You haven't done anything with the black church. 
This is a this is a direct quote. Uh, I can't think of his name, but he's on my LinkedIn. I'm connected to him. <laughs> he says, "Don't worry, we got them. They always vote for us." And look, Pat Quinn lost. Bruce Rauner was elected, you know, um, uh, governor. You know, so I mean, being taken advantage of is a, is a real thing, and that's why we really have to be accountable toward ourselves first. Uh, but I want to hit on this this question. My last question. I want to thank my guests again because I know we run out of time. So. October 15th is the next date uh, for the presidential debate. I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, Trump right now is still recovering from uh, COVID, uh, and he doesn't want to do a virtual debate, right? So I don't know. It's, it's unprecedented. No president has ever canceled a debate. You know, this is really, really new. But let's say it happens. Let's say for whatever reason they get the plexiglass up, they allow both of them to socially distance and to participate in this debate. And I'll start with you, Malik, uh, then you, uh, Bill, Amanda, then Derek. What do you want to hear from either or candidate? Because I feel like whatever has been said, whatever mosquito happens to be in the room, nothing is going to shift any populist, right? It's not going to take away and it's not going to add. But if you could hear your candidate say something, what would that be? Well, I'll say that I think that the debate commission, they've actually canceled that um, debate altogether. And Joe Biden is now scheduling a town hall of sorts with ABC, I think, on that same day. But right. if if I could, you know, if I had a magic wand or a genie in a bottle, what I would actually hope from Donald Trump is that he could take a page out of his uh, VP's book to talk about policy. I honestly think that the, the, you didn't hear much policy in that first debate between whether it was Donald Trump or Joe Biden, there was a lot of stuff that was fed to the red, you know, just as far as red meat. But I think that there is so much that the administration has done that he can legitimately defend. The problem is, is that it typically doesn't happen in those type of forms. Notice in the presidential debate between Biden, um, Trump and Biden, there was no discussion of a black plan or a platinum plan or anything like that. I think that what Donald Trump needs to do is the same thing that he did on Saturday um, at the Blexit event at the White House. Yeah. Talk about your platinum plan. You have stuff. There are a lot of people who are going to criticize it or whatever, but you have it there. Talk about it. It's there for you to use. But whether or not it happens, I don't know. You know, the media, of course, is not going to be Donald Trump's friend, but he has to put these things out himself and be as disciplined as he was on Saturday in talking about things that are germane to the black community. I think that's what he needs to do. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, the plan of what I did see, I saw the the uh, Blexit uh, kind of gatherers with Candace Owen. I saw them on the White House front lawn. I saw that. That was a very interesting, but I do give Trump credit. I mean, he discussed policy and it was a very thorough speech. He didn't really sway too much. I mean, he had a few, you know, Trump isms, but he kind of stayed on course. Uh, Bill, your candidate, whoever that may be, what would you like that person to say since the presidential debate uh, is canceled? Well, he, he, here's the thing. I appreciate Trump for being Trump. You know, he, he, he's going to be himself. And I can deal with anybody as long as I know where I stand with him. And Trump has made it extremely clear where we stand. I really don't have, uh, expect, you know, well, I, I guess my expectation of Trump is for him to show up and be himself. And I'd like for him to continue being himself, you know. And, and he doesn't let anybody put him in a box. He's going to tweet. He's going to call people Sleepy Joe and Nervous Nancy and Pocahontas. And he's going to he's going to do what he's going to do. And, and I think he fits the revolutionary times we're living in, the new normals, the times where, you know, it's time to flip the house upside down. Trump, do you. <laughs> From Biden, I want Biden to take a page out of Trump's manual and be real. Stop playing games with me. Stop playing word games. Stop one day somewhat apologizing for that disastrous crime bill he wrote, and then the next day defending it uh, tooth and nail. Uh, stop trying to shove it down my throat by saying stupid stuff like, well, that's what people in your community want. You know, I mean, if you either you regret it or, you, or you're proud of it, but be real about it. And I'd also like for Biden to get some identity of his own and stop, oh, I served as vice president. <laughs> 
you got to have your own identity. What 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 leg do you have to stand on? So I saw a tweet earlier today that tickled me greatly that said Biden has only created one job in 47 years, and that was for his son Hunter. Okay, he, you know he writes bills that locks people like me up for 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 crazy amounts of time for petty offenses, but he fights to keep his son out of jail for the same uh, kind of uh, situation. And so that that's what I want Biden to do. I want Biden to come out, come clean, be real. Stop putting your foot in your mouth. I don't have to vote for you in order to be black. Matter of fact, I'm not voting for you, and I'm very black. So you know, <laughs> that's, you know, that's what I want from Biden. I want Biden to be authentic, be pure, have some pure ideology to talk about. Not only ideology, but some pure policy and something to say. And answer the question about whether or not you want to stack the Supreme Court. That's going to be very, uh, so yeah, that's it. Trump, keep doing you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I like knowing where I stand with you. Biden, be real. Awesome. Be real. Amanda, what is being real? Should Kanye West come out and be like, I created the platinum plan and the name and I gave it to him? <laughs> I mean, what do you want your candidate to say? <laughs> I, I I think what I would want is asking for, for rainbows and, and unicorns and Skittles to fall out of the sky. I think we're beyond it, which is why I've already voted. Um, there's nothing more, honestly, that can be said from either candidate that would sway me. Let's start with that. Um, what I would like to see just for kicks and giggles is I would like for Trump to show some, some valid emotion about people that he doesn't understand. Um, I would like for him not to say that he knows black people and what they I would like for both of them to stop saying that. Again, we're asking for unicorns and rainbows. Um, We're not going to get that. So at this point, we already know where we stand, who we're voting for. But just for the entertainment value, I would love for Trump to show some empathy. But at the same time, it's a double edged sword, because if he did, we wouldn't believe it anyway. Again, just be who you are. So there's nothing that I can ask for that I would benefit from on either side. When it comes to Biden, I would like to see him punch back a little bit. I would like to see him kind of grab it by his horns and let's let's take this on so that he doesn't seem so submissive when he's pushed into a corner. I would like to see all of this just for kicks and giggles, for entertainment value, because my vote has already been cast. But one thing that I wanted to mention for all of you guys here, um, there's a book that I've been reading. It's called Passing, and it's not anything that's new, but it speaks to everything that we've discussed. It speaks to having literally they talked about having a seat at the table. Um, they talked about why sometimes you have to put on a good face just so you can get somewhere to elevate yourself and your family. And I think that's what we've all talked about throughout this entire conversation where we vote. Sometimes it's straightforward and sometimes it's we want to have a seat at the table. So once we get there, we infiltrate. And I'll be very frank. I mean, I think that's how I've gotten so far in my career is I will put on a good face if that's what you guys want to hear. But I will grab the bull by the horns when it's time. Once I have my seat at the table, you will see what it really is. And so that's what we've all discussed throughout this whole conversation. But when it comes to the debates, um, if there is a debate to be had at this point, I would still tune in just for for humor. The things that I'm asking for, if I were to see them, they would seem like fiction. Um, so let's get it. Let's round it all up. I, I'm, I'm very, very anxious to see how this all unfolds. Awesome. Awesome. Derek, last but not least. So, you know, uh, coming down the home stretch, November 3rd is right around the corner. If you could hear your candidate say anything you know I, I i echo everybody's sentiment i don't i don't think joe is gonna do that i would love to see 2012 joe i would love to see 2008 joe that's the joe that i think we all want to see when he was just coming out swinging but I, I think joe has been coached right to not do that and he's gonna play to that and i i don't want to say that i don't want to say that's that's misleading but at the same time i i also think that um his age is an issue, but let, let me not go there. So I want to hear Derek, what, what do you want to hear uh, from somebody, whoever, even if it's Kanye West, what do you want to hear from your candidate? Well, I think, you know, from, let's, everybody has said that everybody's done a good job of saying this. I think Trump's going to continue to do what Trump has done. And unfortunately, um, the rhetoric that we've continued to hear from him is is abysmal. It's horrible. It's um, it's condemnable. Um, you know, I think what we've seen as far as race riots and race wars in the country, I would like to see him come out 
and condemn, like openly condemn, don't beat around the bush. I would like to see him openly condemn uh, white supremacy and, and, and the hatred that's uh, alive and well in our country. Unfortunately, even if he said it, I wouldn't believe him. I wouldn't care because once somebody shows you who they are, that's who you are. Believe him. So I believe he's a bigot. He's a racist and he will not change in that area. And so from that perspective, I have to look at what I actually do like about that side of the house. And you've already said it. It's just the economic policy. And if the economics is enough for me to say um, I'm going to vote that way, then um, I think I'm a little bit challenging in my own um, my own conscious. Right. Going to that double consciousness. So so for that reason, from the other side, what I would like to hear um is for them to get people off the fence about them and whether or not they're actually going to do some good uh, for the people in the hood, uh, folks that are, you know, least the least of them. Right. right. Um, and I want to hear what that plan is. I want to hear a dedicated plan. Right. That doesn't just speak to the talking points that they've collected from social media, from black social media over the last couple of years and speaking to those talking points not just collecting the buzzwords that came out of a Bernie Sanders campaign or an Elizabeth Warren campaign that rallied uh, hundreds of thousands of millennials and use bits and pieces of that and dangle them as uh, sort of carrots in front of us to get us to jump, but really say, hey, here's our economic policy and we're going all in on it. We're going all in on uh, the the student loan reform and, and getting rid of student loans. We're going all in on helping black and brown people who've been redlined in communities get access to the same type of mortgages that were uh, only given to white folks to build communities like those in the suburbs of New York, where 15,000 homes were built with federal dollars, but had deed restrictions for African-American people that they couldn't live in those communities, right? right? And was federally backed dollars. So un until we start talking about drastic plans that are gonna come into black and brown communities and actually uh, have an economic impact and move the needle for us. I, I, I think the rhetoric we're hearing from both sides uh, is not going to be enough to get uh, some of the folks that are on the fence to say, hey, I'm all in for Joe or I'm all in for uh, the other people. You, you're just going to have folks that are stuck in the middle. And so um, that's where I sit. And unfortunately, uh, it's not a great place to be in. But again, as much as I hate the guy, uh, the rhetoric that's coming from the guy on uh, that's currently sitting in that White House, I think we haven't seen anything that entices us to immediately jump off the cliff and say, Joe, you're our savior today. Even if we right. vote for that lesser of evil, I think we're still asking ourselves the same questions four years from now. Awesome. I love it. Look, I'm going to have to address this because I have a commenter by the name of Michael Sager, who I do not know, but <laughs> I've been reading the comments. Michael, let me set you straight because I watch Roland Martin and I'm from Chicago. So in my area, anybody can get it right. So look, I totally believe in supporting everybody. Anybody knows me knows I have totally condemned Trump on every single thing, racism, bigotry, uh, homophobia, anything that you can list. I have to pretty much put him to the coals on, right? Like I'm voting for Biden. I'm not happy about my vote. I don't think Biden is the savior. I personally don't even really care for Biden that much. I really don't think Biden is going to serve two terms. I really think when it's all said and done, Kamala Harris will be the 47th president of the United States, who I am hoping for, by the way. And my hope and prayer is that Kamala will bring this country to the point that it has to be. I do believe growing up in Chicago, the Democrats have played black people for years. I see it every four years. I have seen every major politician in Chicago since I was a child. Richard Daly, Rob Lagojevich, Jesse Jackson, Jesse Jackson Jr. You can list them. You can name them. Every alderman has stopped by Freedom Temple. I have seen them and I've seen the devastation that has been done to our communities. I have seen gentrification ripped through the hood and our communities have been replaced by those who grew up in the suburbs that I grew up with and our people are getting placed further and further out in the suburbs. But at the same time, I can have the same cognizant and intellectual capacity to appreciate when an economic plan does work. I don't agree with Trump on anything, but at the same time, a broken clock is right at least once a day. And I'll agree with that. And I'll end with that. I want to thank all my guests. I'll start with you, Malik. Where can they connect with you? You're muted, my man. You're muted. <laughs> Totally muted. Actually, you can just, uh, my name is actually spelled out there as it is on Twitter 
and Instagram, Malik Abdul underscore. You can also find me on Facebook as well. Same name. Awesome. I love it. Bill, where can they connect with you? All right, Malik, I'm going to follow you, but I want you to follow back, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ladarius Bill, Instagram at Ladarius Bill, Facebook, L. Jerome Bill. I love it. Amanda, where can they connect with you? Your best bet to connect with me is Instagram, where I am AJ Antisocial, AJ underscore Antisocial. And please send me a note and let me know that you heard me on the podcast or else I might not accept the friend request. Just- Man, you better follow me. I'm going to follow you right after this and I get done. I'm following all of you guys because now I know you guys. But I'm very, I know the ins, the ins and outs and the dark web of social media. So everybody does not get accepted. But if you did hear from me on this podcast, then it's a go. Awesome, Derek. <laughs> My bad for the rant, man. I haven't. I've been on edge ever since Bishop Robinson's show. My bad for that last one. <laughs> Where can they connect with you, man? Uh, Derek Scott on Facebook. You can hit me on Instagram, Hope Pusher Twenty Four, and then check out our website and the work that we're doing in Detroit on the East Side, EJDevCo.com. Uh, we're really focused on inclusive neighborhood development and giving people access to. Uh, development. Uh, we talked about gentrification, but giving people access uh, to their communities and to further that vision uh, that they have for their own neighborhoods and giving them equity in it. So follow us and uh, hopefully there's something there that you may want to participate in and be inspired. Awesome. Look, I love it. Tomorrow's episode is Sports Edition. We're talking about Goat James because they just won the NBA Finals. I'm so excited about that. And the next week I'm showcasing two amazing talents. One, the evangelist Chris and Moore, and the one, the rapper Shaper Jones. And hopefully Malik will bring me on one of his shows that he does, and you'll get to see me on a larger platform. But I appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Till next time. Thank you so much. All righty.